If you walk into any evangelical church and say the phrase, God is good to someone, even if you have never met that person before in their life, that person will immediately respond with, all the time. And then, if you reply with all the time, they will then say, God is good. So, like, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. This interaction can be seen in the hit Christian movie, God's Not Dead. Because God is good. All the time. And all the time, God is good. <laughs> I don't really know when this trend started, but I do know that the concept of God being good is a key part of Christianity. But most of our lives, wouldn't you agree, most of our lives are lived under the truth, life is hard, and God is good. Like how God helped this very wealthy pastor find his phone. So I was getting ready to get up and go upstairs, and as I got up, I looked over, and right next to the metronome on the piano, on that black piano, was a black phone. Now, this is less than five minutes after I'd prayed that prayer. <laughs> five minutes. Not, not five minutes has happened. I started laughing and crying at the same time. <laughs> you are too good, man. You, you, you are. And I'm laughing, and I'm, I'm crying, and I'm going, God, you just show me your goodness one more time. God did in five minutes what I couldn't do in five days. I hope that didn't distract God from answering a starving person's prayer for food or, or someone praying that their house doesn't get destroyed by a hurricane. And it's not just saying that God is good like saying Superman is good. It's that God is good or God is goodness. Like goodness comes from God because God is goodness. So by definition, what we mean by God is the being that is all good. It's not just his opinion. Now, here's where the Muslims might say different, they're going to say that Allah, whatever Allah does is good. Allah, his essence isn't good. What he does is good. Christianity and Judaism are going to say, no, God's essence is good and his commands flow from that essence. So he is the standard of goodness. We learn that God is good. We are bad. Now we live in a world that would say that God is bad and we are good. That God judges us and he floods the world and he creates hell and God's bad and we're good. No, God is good, we are bad. But what if we look at what God actually did in the Bible? Does he really seem like the good guy in that story? Apologists would say that you can't really judge God by the same standards that you would judge a person. But like, apologists aren't the boss of me. Hey everybody, thank you so much for liking and subscribing and commenting and all that wonderful, wonderful stuff. We're getting close to 100,000 subscribers. That's crazy. Every new subscriber, I'm amazed. And you're all fantastic and uh, it's very much appreciated and you're all wonderful. I have the links below for the social media as well as the Patreon and merch. Uh, it's all down there. I uh, appreciate all the support. Um, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Think about some of the greatest villains in cinematic history. Think about what makes them so evil. What makes them so vile. Now, let's take a look at a few stories from the Bible and see how God in the Bible compares. Starting off strong, we got Noah's Ark. And thou shalt takest two of every creature. Two creatures. Two of every creature. Even stink beetles. Especially stink beetles. It's the story you hear from the moment you are born. There are kids' books and toys, and you can even decorate your room with it. It's a story about a big boat, fluffy animals, and a beautiful rainbow. It's also the story of genocide, of whole families drowning, babies getting hurled up against rocks by the waves, uh, tragedy after tragedy. It's a story about God regretting that he made humans and deciding to kill all but eight of them. So what was going on at the flood? Well, the Bible says that God saw that the wickedness of man was great upon the earth and that every intent and thought of his heart was only evil continually. And because of this, the whole world was filled with violence. Well, we know that God will one day judge the living and the dead. So what we have in the flood is a case of God exercising his right as judge to remove that evil from the world. And when we think about it being justified, 
We only know what justice is because our sense of justice is based on God's character. God is even capable of doing something unjust. So God, in his infinite wisdom, decided that the only possible way to fix all of the evil in this world was mass murder. I cherish peace with all my heart. I don't care how many men, women, and children I need to kill to get it. The first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. During the time of Noah, God saw that humanity was wicked. They had appointed themselves as God and rebelled against him. God saw fit to administer his justice through the flood, but don't forget that he also was merciful in saving Noah and his family. You see, God is pro-life, but he is also pro-justice and anti-wickedness. Now, while we might be more comfortable with a God that resembles a character from My Little Ponies, we need to understand that the true God is serious about holy justice and truth I'm on mission what mission peace in our time this would indicate tremendous patience on God's behalf imagine somebody breaks into your home you pull a gun you're like look you stop or I'm gonna shoot you in 120 years I would say you're you're really patient it's like they shot me the answer is like, well, we're not surprised they shot you. We're surprised that they waited 120 years to pull the trigger. That means that they really love you and they gave you every opportunity and there's no excuse. Did I what? You said we would destroy the Avengers, make a better world. It will be better. When everyone is dead. That is not. The human race will have every opportunity to improve. And if they don't? Ask Noah. I will blot out man who I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of heaven, for I am sorry or grieved that I have made them. But, okay, there's a little hope, but, because God didn't need to do anything but just send the flood for everyone. Really, he didn't need to do anything but destroy all the people. Noah found favor. That's the, it's the Hebrew word for grace in the eyes of the Lord. Every single person except one family has only evil intents and thoughts all the time. When we think of it that way, the only just and loving thing for God to do would be to remove that wickedness from the earth. When the earth starts to settle, God throws a stone at it. And believe me, he's winding up. And there's something that theologians will call the order of salvation, which comes first. Do you do good things so God saves you? Or does God save you and change you so that your life begins to change? If you do good works and you're a good person and you get your life together, and then God chooses you because you've earned it, that's called works. If you're a bad person and God shows up and saves you in spite of yourself and changes your desires and gives you a new heart out of which you live a new life, that is salvation by grace. This is a major theme of the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. And some think, well, well, maybe we're saved by works in the Old Testament, grace in the Old Test New Testament. No, we're always saved. Anybody who's ever saved is saved by grace, Amen. not by works. So at the end of the day, the story of Noah is usually told that he was saved by works. The story is usually told somehow like this. Uh, there were good people and bad people. And God chose Noah because he was a good guy, gave him a boat, and he didn't choose the bad guy, so they had to swim for it. So be a good guy, not a bad guy because God loves the good people, hates the bad people. This is how the story is mistold in most children's storybook Bibles. So wait, God can choose people randomly and make them into better people? So we could have done that with all of the men, women, and children he murdered? L like, seriously, am, am I missing something here? They'll understand. When they see, they'll understand. I just need a little more time. But then at the end of the day, he did put up a rainbow to show that he wouldn't do it again. At least in that way. He'll figure out another way to destroy people. God said to Noah, there's gonna be a floody floody. Okay, now, so let, let's look at the Tower of Babel. God came down and saw people working together to make a city and a tower and decided that if they can do this, then there is nothing they won't be able to do. So he decided to confuse them by making them speak different languages. Building a city corresponds to avoiding being dispersed. You'll build a city. 
but the walls around us is safe, secure here, and not going to spread. And building a tower that might reach into the heavens, of course, corresponds to that would make a name for us if we could build such a tower. You could see it from so far away. We would be the center. The story in Genesis 11 is remarkable. God looks down, sees them building a great city. No, no, he didn't look down. The Bible says he came down to the city. Like he took a little vacay, like he was taking a little tour. To make their name great, not his name great. The New Jerusalem is where God's name is made great. Babel was the place where human name was made great. Love of praise. So we're going to make a name for ourselves. So people will think well of us. Whew. Those folks in Shinar are powerful, smart, organized. They know how to make the brick that really lasts. High tower so that they can go up and look down on everyone else and rule and reign as if they are the replacement for God. But looking at the text, it doesn't seem like God is saying, how dare they think this false idea that they can be as great as me. It seems more like he is jealous and nervous that they could become as great as him because of the bricks they make and the tower they built. He's like the evil queen being upset that someone is as beautiful as him. At first sight, this seems like a positive statement. Nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. We say to our kids, you can do anything. You can be president of the United States. You can be a brain surgeon. You can go to the moon. But God knows that success apart from God leads to destruction because pride always destroys. These people work together in unity. Nothing will be impossible for them. Here's the point. Unified unbelievers are more powerful than divided believers. This is why Satan is always trying to divide Christians. Let me just say this. When a Christian attacks a Christian in front of a non-Christian, it's the spirit of Babylon. Again, the text simply says that he's worried they would become too powerful. It's kind of like when the dad character in Umbrella Academy realizes that Victor was becoming too powerful. He didn't find a way to nurture that power or harness that power for good. He gave him drugs to suppress it and locked him up. No. No. Human beings apart from God build weapons of mass destruction, plan genocide, succumb to racism and tribalism. So God's actions in scattering the people is not only an act of judgment, it's also an act of grace. God has a plan that will bring salvation. It's for their good, even though they don't like it or recognize it. It's like when a baby reaches for a hot stove or a child is about to run into the street. You don't reason with them, you stop them. God's act of grace was about the same as the Dursleys hiding the Hogwarts letter. He was afraid of what people would become. But eventually we did get our towers and our cities, and at least this story has no killing in it. So let's take a look at Sodom and Gomorrah. With Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham pleaded for their sake, asking God to spare them for the sake of yet 10 righteous people. And when Abraham pleaded to God and said, God, it doesn't seem fair that you're gonna kill righteous people with the wicked. He says, hey, if I can go into the city of Sodom and Gomorrah and find even 10 righteous people, God, will you spare the city? And God said, yes, if you can find 10 righteous people, I'll spare the whole city. And Abraham was not able to find. So God negotiated with Abraham for Abraham to find 10 righteous people in order to save the city. Is the good guy the guy you need to negotiate with in order to save the city? A battery of VX gas rockets is presently deployed to deliver a highly lethal strike on the population of the San Francisco Bay Area. I will call again at 100 hours to state my demands. Sodom is a story about hospitality, which was one of the most central values uh, in the ancient Near East and occurs over and over and over again. There are dozens of bi biblical citations uh, about the importance of hospitality uh, and how evil the Sodomites were for not only being inhospitable, but for trying to commit an act of violence against their guests. That's what this story is about. We don't have to guess as to the meaning of the story of Sodom because other texts in the Bible tell us directly 
Uh, Ezekiel, for example, states specifically what the sin of Sodom was, inhospi uh, being inhospitable. Uh, again, in the New Testament, again, several times uh, the story of Sodom is talked about, always in the context of violations of hospitality rules. What Sodom is really about is, is an offense done against guests. The nature of that offense doesn't matter so much, as much as the violation of hospitality itself. He destroyed a city with sulfur from above because they weren't hospitable. Like, don't get me wrong, hospitality is a very good thing, but I don't know if you should destroy a city based on a lack of hospitality. Sardine. Jude 7 declares, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. So again, while homosexuality was not the only sin in which the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah indulged, it does appear to be the primary reason for the destruction of the cities. Those who attempt to explain away the biblical condemnations of homosexuality claim that the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was inhospitality. The men of Sodom and Gomorrah were certainly being inhospitable. There is probably nothing more inhospitable than homosexual But to say God completely destroyed two cities and all their inhabitants for being inhospitable clearly misses the point. So then God's answer to this was to destroy a city trying to purify the world with murder. All while saving a guy who offered up his daughters to be assaulted by a mob in order to save strangers that he just met. Scripture does not reveal Lot's reasoning for offering up his daughters. Whatever his thought process was, it was wrong and indefensible. Except the Bible doesn't say that. It continues to show that Lot is a righteous man. In fact, he's rewarded for trying to save the strangers by offering up his daughters. Based on what is revealed about Lot's life, one might wonder if he was righteous. However, there is no doubt that God had declared him to be positionally righteous, even during his time in Sodom. So while God acted like the aliens in the 1996 film Independence Day, Lot and his family left. And then God punished his wife, who is never given a name in the Bible, like a lot of women in the Bible, for looking back at the city, as shown here in a child's craft. So, offering up your daughters for, yeah, uh, is righteous. Looking back at the city gets you turned to stone before he dies. <laughs> And salt is a stone. Don't at me. It's the only stone we eat. Well, unless you count ice, which that there's a debate. Okay, what about a story that isn't about punishment, but a, but about faith? Like God telling Abraham to kill Isaac. His new idea is that I should sacrifice you. Me? Brilliant! Yes, on the fifth day he invented the birds and the fish, and today he's invented me murdering my son. God's command to sacrifice Isaac was to test Abraham's faith. God's tests prove and purify our faith. They cause us to seek him and trust him more. God's test of Abraham allowed his child and all the world to see the reality of faith in action. Faith is more than an inner spiritual attitude. Faith works. How could God possibly ask Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac? Well, keep a couple things in mind. Number one, this was a test for Abraham. Now this test might seem crazy in the present, I get it, but in that culture at that time, it actually made sense. God is saying to Abraham, are you willing to do for me the true God, what all these other people are willing to do for a false God? It was a test of his faith. But second, the point is actually that God is against child sacrifice. Uh, except in Judges 11, when God not only allowed someone to sacrifice his daughter to him, but they made an annual celebration to remember the sacrifice. The story starts in Genesis 22 by saying God tested him, knowing he didn't want him to do it. And we discover another very important thing that we need to communicate to our children on this, is that there was a testing of faith here. Right, and Abraham is held up as a model of the kind of faith that we need to have. In fact, so God was just testing Abraham, like Willy Wonka with Charlie. I had to test you, Charlie, and you passed the test. 
Except the test wasn't whether he would give Slugworth the everlasting gobstopper. The test was if he would be willing to murder his own son. Yeah, this wasn't Wonka. This was Jigsaw. This was your test. Your game. <gasps> and let's not forget that Abraham also had another son who he left out in the desert to die because Isaac was the son of his wife and not his servant. So he doesn't really win any Father of the Year awards. You want to tell me what the that was? And we also have God killing the firstborn of Egypt, also burning Aaron's sons alive because they kind of did sacrifice wrong. <laughs> Let this be a reminder to you all that this organization will not tolerate failure. Or killing Uzza, or Uzza, because he tried stopping the Ark of the Covenant from falling over. Or killing David's baby because of David's sin. But let's talk for a moment about the genocides. Something God ordered his people to do a lot. People read the Bible, they're like, God is so cruel, he killed whole people groups, that was genocide, he's so evil. And God's like, look, if those people didn't die, they would kill everyone. Are we the baddies? And because I love you, I need to end them, otherwise they will end you. Let me say this, when the Bible says that God is love, it doesn't give you permission to go to the Bible with scissors and cut out the parts where it doesn't seem loving but to go to the parts that you are confused by and say, let me assume and presume that God is love and his act here is loving for his beloved. So God killed whole people groups because of his love. Did we just figure out why so many evangelicals are confused by what the word love means? Second thing that we really wanna consider here is that there really is no such thing as an innocent person. You know, oftentimes you hear people say, you know what, how could God order the murdering or the killing of innocent people? Well, the book of Jeremiah says, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? You know, because we sometimes get that positioned and the person immediately is, accepts all the terms and the way that that has been positioned. God commanding the killing of the innocent. You know, there are many parts of that. I would say, first of all, who is innocent? The biblical story is the story from Genesis that we have fallen into sin and all are guilty before a holy God. Wait a minute, I thought all you did was kill innocent people. Innocent? Is that supposed to be funny? It's weird when you see a villain play a villain, like how they almost cast O.J. Simpson as the Terminator. What do we mean when we say genocide? What are we saying when we say genocide? Maybe, just maybe, if you have to define the word genocide in order to defend your god, you're worshipping the bad guy. The entire destruction of an entire, it sounds like it's, you just don't like that people group, and based on your bias and prejudice and hatred of that group, you've decided to wipe the whole group out. Is that really what's, what's being described in the Old Testament? The reality of, of course, is that the Canaanites, for example, all of these people groups were involved in horrific behaviors that God had warned them about for hundreds of years. The kind of stuff that you think, really? How does that even happen? Genocide but random, dispassionate, fair to rich and poor alike. And they called me a madman. And what I predicted came to pass. Congratulations, you're a prophet. I'm a survivor. Who wants to murder trillions. God's destruction was never the result of ethnic cleansing. Rather, it was to cleanse of idolatry as in the case of the Canaanite conquest. It was justified because they worshipped idols? Jealous much. In fact, even the Assyrian and Babylonian nations chastened God's people for caving in to idolatry. Finally, we must remember that God's grace can still be experienced today at the cross. The question is, will you reject it like the Canaanites or embrace it? And so God knew that these nations were very wicked and in his sovereignty, he chose to use Israel as his chosen instrument or tool to purge the earth of the evil that these nations were doing. One reason was because God knew that if he did not do so, then these surrounding nations would then influence his chosen people to do likewise. 
Again, his solution to the problem is a fist. God, in all his infinite wisdom, can't think of any solution besides the death of thousands of people. Bones, I could simply snap my fingers. They would all cease to exist. And I call that mercy. And then what? I finally rest and watch the sunrise on a grateful universe. And what about when he specifically says to kill the babies and children? How can a good God look at a beautiful little cute baby and then just kill it and destroy it and never give it a chance to live? Well, speaking of these Amalekites, God said this. They have raised their fist against the Lord's throne, so now the Lord will be at war with Amalek generation after generation. So in other words, God, because he was all-knowing, he had foreknowledge to know that these babies were going to one day grow up and hinder God's plan and continue to attack God's people. Think of it this way. Let's say you as a loving father had foreknowledge and insight to know that this cute, innocent baby would one day grow up and kill your precious son or daughter. Would you not, as a loving father, do all that you could at all costs to protect the safety and the life of your children? In the same way, God knew that this nation was evil and would continue to stand in the way of his plan. So in his sovereignty, God decided to destroy them completely. He says with a smile on his face. He's saying that God knows who the baby will grow up to be, so it's okay that he murders him. So he's the Terminator? No, he's the he's the future self from Looper. You know, the version that doesn't realize that kids can become good people if they are shown love. Also, in one of these genocides, in Numbers 31, it specifically tells them that it's okay to take any woman who hasn't known a man for themselves. But for this, what happens is some skeptics just fill in the blank with their imagination. Keep them alive for yourself. Oh, so you could sleep with them all you want. And then they become sex slaves. That's the question that was asked. It's not really hard to understand what they mean by that. Sex slaves. Doesn't say that, does it? It doesn't say that, does it? The women could either be servants or they could be potential wives. We have a date. In fact, they weren't there just for sexual usage, which is why they had to be women who had not known a man. Because they couldn't be part of that whole sex system that was going on and the temptation that was going on there. Do you think, uh, do you think these guys are getting down on one knee, making sure that this is something that, that the woman wants to? Or the girl wants to? Or are you just using the word wife to think that justifies it when they're obviously being forced into the situation, even if that is what it means? And you can't force somebody to be your servant. That's called a slave. Then, of course, we have how God treated Job and his family because of a bet. My bet? My bet? Am I a f***ing bet? I don't care for Job. You have a lot of uh, Freddy Krueger stuff in Hosea 13. And there's also a story where God sent 42 bears to kill kids for calling a prophet bald. What? Big bear chase me! And then, of course, there is the whole concept of hell. This one is more New Testament than Old Testament. And even in the New Testament, maybe it isn't meant to be taken literally, but a lot of people believe in it. So let's talk about a God that would send people there. We tend to see God as a kind, merciful being whose love for us overrides and overshadows all his other attributes. Of course, God is loving, kind, and merciful, but he is first and foremost a holy and righteous God. So holy is he that he cannot tolerate sin. He is a God whose anger burns against the wicked and disobedient. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 25. He is not only a loving God, he is love itself. But the Bible also tells that he hates all manner of sin. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. And while he is merciful, there are limits to his mercy. He loves us so much. He loves us so much. He's our number one fan. He's our number one fan. I'll take good care of you. I'm your number one fan. God doesn't send good people to hell because no one is good. 
how could you possibly say that nobody is good when there is literally someone so good that they filmed you walking in the most awkward way possible while wind blows through your clothes and then other people are so good that they told you that this looked really cool and you should totally release it. Those are good people for putting this amazingly awkward content into the world. You cannot tell me that there aren't good people. Hell is reserved, not for those souls who seek God and struggle, but it is reserved for those who defy God and rebel, for those who say about Jesus Christ, we don't want this man to be our king. Or you were just raised in the wrong religion or the wrong form of Christianity. Or you see no evidence for God's existence. But why would God send anybody to hell? Is it because he doesn't, but actually we send ourselves there? I bet we send ourselves there. Part of the answer is that God doesn't send people to hell. If C.S. Lewis is right in his classic book, The Great Divorce, God doesn't send people to hell, people choose it. Nailed it. In fact, towards the end of that book, he famously says, in the end, there's two kinds of people. Those whom say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says, thy will be done. I mean, you're Christing money? There, look there! See what you made me do? All sin is ultimately against God. God is an eternal and infinite being, Psalm chapter 90, verse 2. As a result, all sin requires an eternal punishment. God's holy, perfect, and infinite character has been offended by our sin. Ooh, snowflake. Although, to our finite minds, our sin is limited in time. To God, who is outside of time, the sin he hates goes on and on. Our sin is eternally before him and must be eternally punished in order to satisfy his holy justice. You did it! You did it! You did it! You did it! You murdered my misery! Penny! Please realize the existence of hell brings no pleasure to God. Medieval depictions of people being tortured mercilessly and endlessly, and somehow God reveling in this with pleasure are false. Hell is a terrible place. We have been designed to be in a relationship with God and relationship with other people. And in hell, all of that is lost. But in Ezekiel 18 verse 23, God asks this. He says, do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked? Would I not rather that they turn from their wicked ways and live. But you're not good. You're just another lying old dirty birdie. And I don't think I better be around you for a while. Doctrine of hell is a hang up for a lot of people. How could a good God send people to hell for all of eternity? I want you to think about it this way. If God is actually a good judge, he has to punish sin. And because we've all broken God's law, he would be a bad judge if he just let us go. Think about it this way. If a man hurts someone in your family and they're standing before a judge and they're like, judge, I'm really sorry, can you let me go? And the judge is like, well, you apologize, so I'll let you go. And he goes free. Would that be just? No, you would be furious. Justice has to take place. Danny. Whatever you think I'm not doing, please don't do it. <laughs> and for God. Shh, darling. Trust me. God's sake. It's for the best. Hey, please! God loves us. John chapter 3, verse 16, and wants us to be saved from hell. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. But because God is also just, and righteous, he cannot allow our sin to go unpunished. Someone has to pay for it. In his great mercy and love, God provided his own payment for our sin. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to pay the penalty for our sins by dying on the cross for us. You might be wondering, well, why can't God just forgive? If God can do anything, can't he just announce that we're forgiven? Well, yes, God can do anything, but he can do anything consistent with his moral nature. God is the holy, righteous judge of the universe. Therefore, he can't be indifferent to sin. So he's not all powerful. But what God has done is even better. 
You see, he's offered the death of his son, Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect, sinless life as an act of love towards us, but also as an act of justice. Okay, well, let's take a look of that act of love and justice. Why does the God of love need torture and death in order to forgive us? Why did he have to pay for our sins in such a brutal way? Well, the answers are found in scripture. Let's start with this. From the very beginning, Jesus knew he was going to die. I mean, when you really get down to it, he was born to die. He came to earth on a rescue mission to be born in the manger at Bethlehem, to live his perfect life, fulfill his ministry, and voluntarily go to a cross and die for the sin of the world. And Jesus said in John 10, my father loves me because I laid down my life. What a great dad. Oh, what a great dad. Almost as good as Abraham. How does a God that is supposed to be against human sacrifice decide to reboot his religion with a human sacrifice? God's grace gives us the ability to live life as we should, that is to, to love our neighbors and to love God. But there's one aspect of our experience that God's grace could not help us with because it was foreign to his nature, specifically to suffer and to die. God doesn't suffer because suffering is a consequence of some deprivation. For example, we suffer when we are hungry because we are deprived of food. But God lacks nothing and is life itself. So suffering from deprivation or death are unfamiliar experiences to him. Then why is he so irritable and angry all the time? Sounds like he's hangry to me. So, ladies. So, losers. Stacy, relax. I'm sorry. You're not you when you're hungry. Unless he creates the circumstance in which he can experience them. And that's exactly what he did through the incarnation of Jesus. Jesus had to die because there was no other way to satisfy God's righteous demands. Listen to this, <clears throat> excuse me. God plays by his own rules. And he has said in his word, the soul that sins shall surely die. He plays by his own rules that he created. He also knows everything that has happened and will happen. So he could have made any rules but somehow still painted himself into the human sacrifice corner? What is it? What, what is that? What is that? What is it? Oh, no, not the bees! Not the bees! Bees? Beads. Beads? God said that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And all of those Old Testament sacrifices were all pointing to the complete and finished work of Jesus on the cross. Because as John the Baptist said, Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Why would a good God need a blood sacrifice at all? Like he said, God is playing by his own rules, but seems more like the evil gods from the cabin in the woods than a God is good all the time type character. Their blind eyes see nothing of the horrors to come. Their ears are stopped. They are the God's fools. Well, that's how it works. Cleanse them. Cleanse the world of their ignorance and sin. Bathe them in the crimson of... Am I on speakerphone? So God forgives us. But not only that, he makes a way for our suffering to be redemptive. He tells us to pick up our cross and to follow him. And that if we embrace our cross the way that he did, then we will be perfected in his grace. A grace he can now give us because he suffered as we do. The stone demands a sacrifice. Of what? In order to take the stone, you must lose that which you love. A soul for a soul. If you knew nothing about the Bible or Christianity and you just heard about this character that demanded blood after blood after blood until finally deciding to kill and torture his own son. I really doubt that you would bow down to that character or think he's a good character. I'm not 
not the bad guy. Everyone keeps looking at me like I'm the bad guy, but I'm not the bad guy. Well, you're not the good guy. Yeah, that's for sure. The story of God in the Bible is a story about a bloodthirsty, petty, jealous being who created imperfect people and then throws a fit when they aren't perfect. Which makes me glad that it's just a story. You don't have to live in fear that you might make some old god angry because you don't follow his arbitrary rules or simply for being who you are. And you don't have to make arguments defending that old, angry god anymore. You can actually be free. God is all the villains wrapped into one character. But he doesn't get a redemption arc. I'm the bad guy? Yeah. <laughs> How'd that happen? Hey everybody, thank you so much for making it this far. If you know somebody who may enjoy it, send it their way. And um, you have yourself a beautiful day. Work, 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 Sky Moon. <laughs> <laughs>